Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 137 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for, I think, the week of December 12th to 18th, 2013. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away about things that uh, I think you deserve to know about. Have any comments, questions, reactions, whatever to the show, email me, whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com is the email address. Um, or if you prefer, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, get the email address from there or comment there. And if you uh, do email me, please include something in the subject line so I know it's not spam. And uh, be a little patient. Uh, I'm a little slow about dealing with my email. But uh, all right, going through that quickly uh, because we've got a lot of stuff to get to. Now, I, I had a week off, took a week off. And uh, just got back the other day. Yes, my wife and I actually took a little vacation. Um, yes, we had a good time. Yes, we saw lots of great scenery. Uh, went by train, which is the only way to go. And um, so that, you know, a little bit off when we come back. Little things get a little bit confused and off. So I'm a little off. Um, well, I, I'm actually in a bit of a blue funk politically. Uh, don't have the energy that you think you have after a week off. But... I, I actually kind of know why. Um, see, I was reading an article the other day on common science facts that, according to this survey, uh, a lot of Americans don't know. One of the questions was about, um, these are multiple choice questions, by the way. One of the questions was about what element was involved in global warming, and the answer was carbon. Now, in terms of global warming and the effect, it would actually be more accurate to talk about carbon dioxide, but the question was about an element, so carbon. Oh, here's the point. The question asked nothing about the human contribution of global warming, nothing about people affecting it, nothing about people causing it, nothing about that. It was strictly about the chemical process involved in warming. But wouldn't you know it, despite that, the comments section on this article were chock-a-block with people going, global warming's a hoax, and the world hasn't warmed in 15 years, and besides, the climate is always changing, and how can people affect the climate of the whole planet, and blah, 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 they blather. And it struck me, as it has struck me before, that these are the same arguments you always get whenever this subject comes up. Whenever you get into an argument with one of these natty natty naysayers about global warming, you always get the same arguments. No matter how many times they've been refuted, rebutted, disproven, the next time you get into an argument, you will get the same arguments over and over again. Uh, there's a line at Skeptical Science that I love. They said, this is a quote, Arguing with some climate change contrarians is similar to attempting to debate with a well-trained parrot that can memor has memorized some 20 statements that it can squawk out at random, which is an excellent description of the experience. And the thing is, in reading this, and reading this comments, I was reminded of one of my rules of right-wing debate, which I probably should reprise here at some point. I did it a long time ago. I should do it again. But one of those rules was, when a claim of yours has been debunked, continue to use it anyway. When it has been debunked so thoroughly and completely that continuing to use it is counterproductive, stop using it for a couple of weeks, a couple of months maybe, and then use it again as if the debunking had never happened. But what really got me here, though, which really just got me in this funk here, is that I was doing, and I realized that this is happening all around me. It seems like everywhere I turn, every issue you face, you're faced with the same thing, getting the same exact old arguments that have been long since shot down. All right, global warming, fine. Yes, global warming is very real, thank you very much. In fact, according to a recent study uh, by 18 leading scientists, uh, they determined that the generally agreed standard of having to keep global warming below two degrees Celsius in order to hit off the worst effects of it, that that standard is actually much too generous. And we actually need to keep it below one degree Celsius. We have already seen a tenth of a degree Celsius warming. And the authors of the study admit that their goal is, quote, essentially unattainable, unquote. And by the way, yes, the world has warmed over the past 15 years. The claim to the contrary is based on an entirely bogus comparison of comparing the particular year 1998 with the year 2010. 
The thing is, 1998 was an outlier. It was considerably warmer than the years just before or just after. If you shift that 12-year comparison just a little bit, compare 1996 to uh, 2008, compare 2000 to 2012, you see a clear upward trend. And in fact, the decade 2001 to 2010 was clearly warmer than the decade of 1991 to 2000. Now, but that's global art. You want another example? Social Security. Again, we're getting told the same things. Oh, we have to cut Social Security. We have to trim benefits because otherwise the whole system will go under in 30 years. Oh my God, uh, it, it, the trust fund will hit zero. It's a solvency crisis. Uh, yeah, except for one thing. That surplus was deliberately created in order to deal with the baby boomer retiree bulge that everybody knew was coming. So drawing down that surplus was the idea from the beginning. Well, yes, we get told, but, but then we'll have to cut benefits at that point by, by uh, like 23%. Uh, well, yeah, that's true. If we do absolutely nothing in the in intervening 30 years, like, for example, raising or better yet, eliminating the cap on income that's subject to Social Security taxes. If we eliminated that cap, that would have no effect on over 85% of wage earners, but would make the system solvent as far out as the economic projections go. And frankly, here's the thing, even if we do nothing at all, even if we do nothing at all, because of the way that, remember that 23% cut is to projected benefits. It's not from current benefits. It's from projected benefits 30 years from now. Um, and because of the way initial benefits are calculated, that 23% cut would actually still leave those seniors with a slightly better standard of living than current initial benefits provide to people retiring now. All right, you want another example? Voter ID. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was a move in the Massachusetts House to impose a photo ID requirement on voters. Now, the measure was killed, happily enough, but it was the arguments for this measure that struck me. First, they argued that the measure would prevent voter fraud and that people can't cash a check, rent a car, or even enter some government buildings without an ID, which are exactly the same arguments. And I mean essentially word for word the same arguments you hear every time this subject comes up, everywhere it comes up. Every time somebody wants to make it harder for the wrong sorts of people to vote, the same arguments are being advanced. So let's go through this one more time. Renting a car is not a basic function of a republic. It's not a basic human right of a free people, not something to be actively encouraged. And while there is absolutely no evidence of any significant or even noticeable measure of voter fraud, in-person voter fraud, which is the only kind that these ID laws would affect, there is evidence, both from surveys and the actual experience of states that have done this, that these laws hinder people from voting, particularly among the poor and among minorities, who are exactly those wrong sorts of people that the pushers of these bills would prefer were just shut out of the process entirely. Now, there's a whole bunch of uh, food stamps, uh, unemployment, the economy. There's all kinds of areas where this has happened. I could go on in this for the entire show, but so I'm going to cut myself off there so we can move on. What we're going to move on to is uh, one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award. And I actually have two Clown Awards this week. I, I thought I had the one, the absolute clown, but I came across a worthy contender. It's not up to the championship standards of the original, but it's worthy of attention. So consider this a Clown Award honorable mention. It goes to the administration of Minneapolis Community and Technical College, a two-year community college that prides itself on having one of the most diverse student bodies in Minnesota. A black female professor named Shannon Gibney at that school teaches a course called Introduction to Mass Communication. In that, she has a lesson on structural racism, which would seem to be relevant for anybody who wants to analyze and understand the impact of mass communication. Well, three white male students didn't like this. 
Why do we have to talk about this, demanded one. Another one chimes in with, yeah, it's always like to try to make white guys the bad ones, the villains. Why do we have to do this? These three guys continued to argue and disrupt the class to the point where she told them if they had a problem with her, they could file a formal complaint with the school's legal affairs department, which they did. As a result of which, the school formally reprimanded her for officialdom, or official dum dum said, creating a hostile learning environment. That's right, they reprimanded her for creating a hostile learning environment on the basis that three white male twits, barely old enough to be out of short pants and with even less maturity, whined about having to hear that, yeah, racism actually exists. That was just too hostile for their delicate psyches. Frankly, maybe they should rename this place the Minneapolis Community and Technical Preschool and have the, children, have the students, or at least some of them, take afternoon naps so they don't get cranky. Besides, they wouldn't actually even have to hire clowns for any of the kiddie parties because there were already enough of them in the administration. All right, but here. Here's our champion, and yet yeah, it rises right to the top, or to the bottom, whichever way you care to think about it. This has gotten some attention, so you may well have heard about this one already, but still, it absolutely demands acknowledgement. So the winner this week of the super duper big red extra glossy red nose is that icon of inanity, that doyen of doofishness, former Senator Rick I Should Be in a Sanitarium. He was on Bill O'Reilly's show last week. And you know Bill O'Reilly, the man with the world's most perfect initials. Anyway, he was on Bill O'Reilly's show discussing the death of Nelson Mandela. And after the B.O. man offered some praise of Mandela, which he had to punctuate with, but he was a communist, which actually wasn't, by the way, but never mind that for now. Uh, but after B.O. said that, Ricky chimed in with this, and I'm quoting, Nelson Mandela stood up against a great injustice and was willing to pay a huge price for that. That's the reason he's mourned today, because of that struggle that he performed. What he was advocating for was not necessarily the right answer, but he was fighting against some great injustice. And I would make the argument that we have a great injustice going on right now in this country with an ever-increasing size of government that is taking over and controlling people's lives, and Obamacare is front and center in that. That's right. Rick, I should be in a sanitarium, said Obamacare is just like apartheid. And fighting against people having a better chance at having health insurance is just the same as fighting against nationwide institutionalized bigotry, racism, and oppression. And what's more, collecting your fat speaking fees is just the same as being sent to prison for 27 years. Exactly the same. Former, sec former Senator Rick, I should be in a sanitarium, really is a clown. But wait, we're not finished. What really raises us to true championship level is the fact that among the things Mandela worked for after he was elected president of South Africa was, wait for it, affordable health care for all South Africans, including establishing a government-funded health care system for those who could not afford the private system. A fundamental right to health care is now written into the new South African Constitution, and the nation plans to have a universal health care system in place by 2020. So when it comes to being a clown, Rick, I should be in a sanitarium, really, really is a champion. We are going to take a break. And we're back. And by the way, namaste, which I forgot to say earlier. Uh, we're back here now with our other regular weekly feature. It's the outrage of the week. So it seems that um, all the liberals are all excited when Bill de Blasio won election as mayor of New York in a runaway that was widely seen as a rejection of the uh, right-wing pander-to-the-rich policies of Rudy Giuliani. One of the things de Blasio campaigned on was criticizing the city's notorious racist and unconstitutional stop and frisk policy. Now, I've talked about this thing a number of times before. Uh, basically, this is a policy which comes right down to it that, in the name of fighting crime, served mostly as an excuse for cops to harass young black and Hispanic men. 
Well, de Blasio was strong enough on this that he specifically pledged that if he was elected, he would drop the city's appeal of a court ruling which put restraints on and some oversight on the practice. Okay. So why in heaven's name has he chosen as his police commissioner, Bill Bratton, the man who practically invented stop and frisk and was the man who brought the practice to New York City in the first place when he was top cop under Rudy Giuliani from 1994 to 96? This simply makes no sense. The big excuse we get is that Bratton had a stellar record of lowering crime rates and was a legend during his time in New York on just that basis. That, quite frankly, is a bunch of BS and PR. All right, look at this graph. Look at this graph now. Now, fortunately, the text does not show up, so I'm going to have to explain to you what this, what this graph actually says. It's a graph of the rates of violent crime in New York over a period of time. The vertical axis is the crime rate, higher, higher up, the higher the crime rate. The horizontal axis is time. The period of time is from 1985 on the far left to 2012 on the, on the right end of the graph. The alternate light and dark areas uh, on the graph are the periods of time in which various people were police commissioner in New York City. The darkest bar, the one in the middle, that's Bratton's time. All right, here's the thing. Notice absolutely very clearly, unquestionably, that the steep drop in violent crime in New York City began well before Bratton came on board in 1994. In fact, that peak there is 1990. Crime had been dropping for four years before he ever became police commissioner, and it continued to drop for more than 10 years after he left. Meanwhile, in other large cities with crime rates, violent crime rates similar, comparable to New York, the same kind of pattern happened, a steep drop beginning about 1990. Crediting Bratton and his police state policies with reducing violent crime is a lie. So why did de Blasio pick him? Now, another claim we get is that after running a, quote, far left, unquote, campaign, de Blasio needs to reassure more centrist New Yorkers, and picking Bratton will do that. And that at least has some plausibility. But why would someone who won election with, and this is not a mistake, over 73% of the vote feel the need to immediately turn his back on the people who voted for him in order to placate the people who didn't and never will? Uh, that, to me, I, I have to be is a complete mystery. So here's what I think is the real reason. Bratton believes in what's called the broken windows theory of policing. This is under which cops focus on the low-level stuff, the petty stuff, the graffiti painters, the turnstile jumpers, the, the pot smokers, under the odd notion that if you do things like that, things like armed robbery and rape and murder will just kind of go away in their own. The practice will produce impressive arrest totals, but its efficacy in reducing violent crime is, let's just say, questionable. But Bratton believes in it. And so, according to his own words, does Bill de Blasio, who believes in this, even though the broken windows theory is what underlines the whole notion of, it provides the whole logical backing for stop and frisk. So frankly, what I think de Blasio was after is what you might call a kinder and gentler stop and frisk. One that could continue the pattern, but without the bad PR. Something Bratton was successful in doing while he was top cop in Los Angeles was freeing, that's his word, the LAPD from a federally imposed uh, court, uh, court decree, consent decree, about its bigoted policing practices. And he did that despite expanding the use of stop and frisk and despite a 70% increase in non-lethal force used in black communities. Frankly, I imagine Bill de Blasio is hoping for the same thing in New York about the court order about stop and frisk. One person commenting on all this said the choice of Bratton is, quote, potentially troubling, unquote. I call that a masterpiece of understatement and I call the selection of Bill Bratton and outrage. Oh, by the way, there's a PS to this. Uh, an addition of um, little thing that I call it the little thing. 
is what it's called. Because sometimes it's the little thing, the passing reference, the, the, to the tossed off phrase in something that really gets to me. And this is an example of that. It was in Swampland. This is a column about politics. It's a regular feature of Time magazine. It was in Swampland where reference was made to Bill de Blasio as having run a far left campaign for mayor of New York and then he chose Bratton for police commissioner to be more centrist. Excuse me? He got over 73% of the vote. How? By any rational consideration, by any rational meaning of the term, that campaign was the center. It did represent the center and a fair hunk of the space to the left and the right of it. How can 73% of the vote be far left? Is Tom just saying that far left is that popular, at least in New York City? No. No, of course not. They're not saying that. They're simply reflecting the conventional wisdom, or more properly, the conventional stupidity, that the center is always somewhere to the right of where you are. So unless you want to cut Social Security, they'll say you're far left, even though a heavy majority of Americans don't want to do that. Uh, unless you want to cut food stamps, you're far left, even though most Americans are against that. If you want to raise taxes on the richest amongst us, you're far left, even though most Americans do want to do that. The list goes on and on and on and on and on, and now it's being applied to New York, where apparently, if you want to crack down on unconstitutional stop and frisk, if you believe in court orders, and if you don't want to worship at the altar of Wall Street, you are far left, even if you got over 73% of the vote. Same as it ever was. All right, moving on from there. Just very quickly, a couple of um, anniversaries uh, occurring around this time that I thought were worthy of attention. So I'm going to take them in chronological order. The first, December 15, 1791, was the day the state of Virginia ratified the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, making the Bill of Rights a formal part of the U.S. Constitution. December 8th, 1980, was the day John Lennon was shot and killed. And uh, I think it's a mark of uh, the, the measure of his impact on the culture that people still mark the day and still remember the effect it had on them. Finally, December 14th, 2012, was the day Adam Lanza shot his way into the Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, and murdered 20 children and six adults before committing suicide. Now, I'm not going to go through the bloodstained halls of the school. I'm not going to run down a timeline of events that has already been done too many times to too little purpose. And if you want to know just how little purpose, there is actually an online computer game, or at least there was. There's been an effort to get it down, so it may not be there anymore, but there's an online computer game called The Slaying of Sandy Hook Elementary, which allows you to reenact Lanza's actions, starting with murdering your mother in her sleep before you head off to the school. And at the, uh, at the end of the game, which at the school lasts as long as the time for his massacre, you are scored on how many people you managed to kill in that time. Now, the author of this game, his name is Ryan Jake Lamborn. He claimed that it was intended to be about the importance of gun control, which, even if this is somehow true, this is such a sick way to do that, that it only just demonstrates just how sick our whole, whole gun culture is. And we are indeed sick with guns, obsessed with guns, drooling over guns, saturated with guns. We, as a people, as a culture, we are hooked on, we are addicted to the feelings of power, of independence, of control that guns can bring. Even those of us who don't have guns, and by the way, that's the majority of us. Over the last 30 years, the number of people who own a gun has never exceeded about 30%. The number of households that have a gun has never exceeded 50%. And both of those numbers have been on a steady, gradual decline over that time. But even those of us who don't own guns still get caught up in the mythology of it all. But even so, something else I'm not going to go over here again is the arguments over guns. And I refuse to say over gun control because the sort of tepid quarter measures that are usually described by that, uh, won't, they might snip away at the edges 
of the violent crime rate. They might dull some of the some of the sharper edges of the violence, but ultimately they change very little because. Well, bluntly, while things like expanded background checks are good on their own merits, they don't address the real issue, which is our gun culture, our enthrallment to the fantasy of weaponry. And what's more, guns are another area where you always invariably, inevitably meet the same old tired arguments, the same cliches, the same bumper stickers. If you raise the mass murders like Newtown or Aurora or Columbine, they'll in one breath denounce you for politicizing a tragedy. How dare you? And in the next breath insist that if there were only more guns around, if only more people had guns, then some brave soul would have taken out the shooter like some combination of John Wayne, Bruce Willis, and Spider-Man. No matter how many studies you can cite, connecting rates of gun ownership with rates of gun violence, they will screen sacred Second Amendment. No matter how much historical data and legal argument you can present to show that the Second Amendment was about maintaining a militia at a time when nobody thought about the idea of a standing army, they don't care, they'll just scream Second Amendment even louder. When you cite legal precedent, they'll stop screaming long enough to say, the Supreme Court has spoken, so shut up. When you ask them why if that's true, they didn't shut up in the face of the decades of preceding Supreme Court precedent, they'll just scream Second Amendment again. I know, frankly, I have gone through the arguments, I've made the arguments, I've actually made the arguments at some length. Last January, in the wake of the Newtown Massacre, I discussed guns, gun violence, gun laws, and so on, over a period of eight weeks on this show. Uh, In doing so, I also uh, cited, I remember those studies I was just referencing about gun violence and gun ownership. I also discussed how the Heller decision, this is the 2008 Supreme Court decision that for the first time said there was an individual right to own guns, actually denied both precedent and original intent, while at the same time not going as far as the gun nuts thought it did. I'm not going to go through all that again. If you want, go to my website. Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. Look for the entry of left side of the aisle number 137. At the bottom, I will have links to all eight of those things. You can look at them yourself or email me and I'll send you the list of links. For the moment, all I can do is just say that I'm tired. I am worn out. Particularly, I am worn out with anger at the spinous, crawling, not even worthy of being called wimps, Democrats in Congress who are too preoccupied with keeping a firm grip on their sinecures that they can't even see the blood on their hands. As of December 10th, at least, and remember, this this figure does not include suicides, at least 11 1,395 Americans have been killed by guns in this country since Newtown. At least 96 of them in Massachusetts. That is our gun, our real gun heritage. You have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. Peace.